we're going to be um, introducing the reading apprenticeship framework um, for the work that you do with your foster youth students um, on your campuses, in your programs, in your counseling ses sessions, um, during conversations you have with them with financial aid. And I'm really excited to have Nika Hogan with us from West Ed. She is the National Coordinator for Reading Apprenticeship with West Ed. In addition, she's Associate Professor of English at Pasadena City College. So we're really excited to have her today um, to enlighten us on some new and innovative work around little literacy and how this could be a very powerful skill um, that we can help shepherd our foster youth in mastering. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. Of course, we need to go through some logistical issues and details. So you've got the call-in number there on your screen, um, access code there as well. If you have any issues um, logging on or hearing us, please feel free to submit those questions into your questions panel, as you see there on the right-hand side. I will be monitoring those questions throughout the um, presentation this morning. And if you have any questions, burning questions, that you'd like to be addressed during Q&A, that is where those go as well. And of course, all of our presentation materials and a recording of this presentation will be posted on our website at cacollegepathways.org in about 24 hours. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Debbie Rauscher, my colleague, to give a quick update on the legislative things happening in the state. Debbie? Thanks, Devin. So I, before we jump into the content of today's webinar, I wanted to give folks a couple of quick updates on what we've been working on on the policy front. So folks may be aware that we're continuing to work on trying to get funding in the budget for SB 1023 the bill that passed last year to expand support for foster youth at community colleges. So we've been working extremely hard on this, and we actually have our first budget hearing coming up next Wednesday the 8th, um, uh, the budget committee hearing. And so if any of you folks are within driving distance to Sacramento, we're looking for folks to come to the hearing and bring foster youth to testify. The hearing's in the late afternoon at 4 o'clock. So if that's something that you think you might be able to do, please send me an email um, at debbie, D-E-B-B-I-E, at johnburtonfoundation.org. The next hearing after that is April 30th, which is a Thursday at 9.30 in the morning, and we're going to be looking for folks for that hearing as well. So definitely uh, please reach out to me if you think you might be able to lend some support for that effort. Also wanted to let folks know that we have another bill we're working on this year around uh, obtaining foster youth status verification. So this is a bill that would allow the state California Department of Social Services to provide verification of foster youth status directly to youth uh, in cases where they have been unsuccessful in obtaining the verification from their local county. So just wanted folks to know that that's happening. And lastly, we've been working with the California State Aid Commission on revamping how CHASE grants are administered to get them out more quickly to students and make the process more efficient. They have established a working group specifically to create recommendations around this issue. And so again, if anybody on the call is interested in participating in the CHASE working group, please go ahead and send me an email and I will connect you to the appropriate folks over at CSAC. And so just as a reminder, my email is Debbie, D-E-B-B-I-E, -E, at johnburtonfoundation.org. Feel free to reach out to me um, if you want to get involved in any of those efforts. And with that, I will turn it over to Nika. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. And um, I trust you can hear me, or if not, Devin and Debbie will let me know. Thank you so much for being here today and for choosing to attend this webinar. Um, it's uh, really close to my heart. The reason why I do this work is because I believe that literacy in general and academic literacy in particular is um, empowering for our students and especially those students who are traditionally marginalized. And that certainly does apply to the foster youth population that you all are working with. So um, I wanted to uh, begin today's webinar by showing you a slide that I show pretty much at every um, 
workshops that I do. And a lot of times I'm talking to classroom faculty and I show them these, um, these bullet points and I say, do you recognize these students? And you can see some of the bullets are, they're inexperienced, but they're not beginning readers. In other words, um, they're not actually illiterate or they don't actually have serious trouble um, with reading per se, but they don't seem to read very effectively. They lack confidence, they're mentally passive, or when they do read academic texts, they have limited comprehension. They're not held accountable for much um, academic reading. They expend a lot of energy covering up what they don't understand, and they seem like they have limited knowledge of topics um, that they encounter in their academic texts. And I've never had a room full of participants um, whether they be high school teachers or community college teachers or four-year university teachers that have never had anybody say, hmm, no, not, none of that resonates uh, with me. And so although this is the kind of a webinar where I don't get to talk to you and it's just me talking, I'm sort of guessing that these may resonate with you as well. Um, and so there's a sense of something going on about reading in particular, something going on about, what, about academic literacy in our students in this generation that there's a lot of shared concern about, and it really resonates with a lot of educators. So I know that your question is, what is the relationship between academic literacy and your work with foster youth in higher education? I think that um, there's a big answer to that, which is that it's a key. It's one of the keys to being an insider rather than an outsider in this world. I think that academic literacy is um, like one of the keys to being an empowered person in the 21st century. So it's not just about school, it's outside of school as well. Um, so I'm going to make that case for you and I will try to keep it uh, lively and I trust that you will interrupt with questions as needed. Um, so here's the agenda for today. Um, I wanted to just start with that first part, um, giving you my argument for um, why I think that focusing on academic literacy is particularly important for every student, for everybody these days, so the context of literacy in the 21st century. And then move to talking about what this reading apprenticeship framework is um, and how it can be helpful. I'll talk about, I'll just give some overview of the framework. Um, I'll talk about how classroom instructors use it and what it sort of looks like or feels like and then we'll um, and then the third part is we will explore some ideas about how this framework is useful and usable in various contexts and then you know resources for how you can learn more if you'd like to and then we'll have time for questions and answers okay so um, when Devin and I did a run through of the webinar we saw that we learned that if I showed a video, it would be, you know, so for some people it would play regularly and for others it would not. So that was no good. But I was going to start with a clip um, that I really like from Michael Wesch, who's a professor at Kansas State University. And he's done a lot of thinking about our students in this 21st century. And one of the, um, and you can Google him and find he, he has a lot of talks that are online online that are really fun and interesting to watch. but. One of my favorites is he talks about um, us living in the age of whatever, and he means whatever in two ways. One is that it's that sort of attitude of like whatever, you know, it's like all these amazing, fabulous and miraculous things happening. Um, and, you know, my son is just turning seven next week and he's already got the whatever, you know, down. Um, but then he also says that it's a time of, you know, whatever, anything's possible. So it's tremendously exciting, you know, so much rapid change and, and learning, so much information out there, so much possibility. Um, and that this, that part, the exciting part, actually might contribute to the ennui part because it's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming. And there are a lot of people who are writing about these, that these days. There's another author named Alex Tang who has a book out called The Distraction Addiction. And he talks about how we're all suffering from something that Buddhist monks call monkey mind, you know, and I know this is true of me. We sit down to focus and do something, but then your device beeps or, you know, something else, or you're just so used to um, dividing your attention among so many different things that it's really hard to get out of the habit of doing that. It's really hard to stop doing that. 
And um, somebody, Nicholas Carr, has also written a book called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And so, and of course, we can see this with our students. You know, I discovered a, a certain point that when I t would tell my students to refer to the text, they would be like, oh, what, did you text us? <laughs> so I realized that, um, no, 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 that's not what I mean by text. So reading is changing. Um, what it means to read is changing. Uh, and it's important. And it's not necessarily all to the negative. It's not to say that, oh, these kids these days or whatever. I mean, everybody, every generation says that. It's not that. It's just to recognize what's happening and to be um, and to be cognizant of its impact. And for me, it's got a tremendous social justice implication. Um, the information-rich world that we all live in and that we're all navigating. And somehow what's happening um, concurrent with this overflow of information, and I would say this enormous overflow of needing to be able to read quickly, well, fluently, and critically, uh, which is the kind of reading that we do online, or the kind of reading we do in our generation, older people, um, not necessarily the next generation might not do all of the moves that we do with online reading. But that kind of navigating of information is, is incredibly important to live a rich and, and empowered life. So unfortunately, though, at the same time that we are moving into that territory more and more, a lot of professors are eliminating reading from their courses. They find that students don't buy the textbook. They feel that they can't count on students to read the textbook. Um, and they just sort of, a lot of professors will tell you, well, they don't do the reading, so I just digest it for them into a PowerPoint. I tell them what they need to know for the test. And there's uh, something rational about that. But at the same time, if that's the experience that students have over and over again, they really never do have the experience of grappling with complex texts that are difficult for them and finding their way through that. And most of all, developing a sense of capacity to do that um, and tenacity with difficult texts. And the truth is that we all have to deal with difficult texts. It's tax season, you know. We all have to be able to figure out how to navigate um, documents and forms and, um, and kinds of literacy experiences that are not pleasant but are necessary. So I wanted to draw this point out with an example from my own personal reading experience. And this is just to be transparent. Um, this is some, something that we value a lot in reading apprenticeships because we're focusing um, on the personal, social, cognitive, and knowledge building dimensions of learning and of reading together. And so this is just a dip into my personal dimension. But um, just an example of the kinds of texts that we all navigate. And you might think about, you know, the last time your child got a rash and you Googled it and the next thing you know you called 911 because there's so much information out there about all kinds of things and we have to figure out what to do with it. And a lot of times um, there's, you pretty much just want to call 911 for whatever. Um, but a couple of years ago, um, I realized that I had the um, BRCA1 genetic mutation, the marker for, um, for cancer, which was really important for me to find out because my mother and my grandmother had both died really young from ovarian cancer. Um, it was also kind of amazing to find out because I discovered through this genetic text that I'm Jewish, which I didn't know because my grandparents came to this country after World War II um, and they had met in a relocation camp. And so it raises all kinds of interesting, um, very rich, lots of things on my personal to-do list in terms of researching. But when I found this out, the main thing was I just needed to figure out what am I going to do about it um, and how am I going, you know, not going to share this terrible fate that so many women in my family have had. So this example, this screenshot of this website is um, a decision tool that somebody put online for women with BRCA mutations. And you get to plug in, you know, okay, well, here's my age and here's the surgery that I'm considering having. I can have my ovaries removed. I can have a mastectomy. I can have neither. I can just do these different kinds of screening. And let's see what my chances are of dying young. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it seems like a good idea for helping me navigate. Um, and so one afternoon, I was trying to research and figure out what I was going to do, and I um, and I used this decision-making tool. And I'm showing you right now the screen of what I saw, um, and I felt like um, I really didn't like what I was seeing because no matter what I did, it seemed if I do, um, you know, if I do every kind of surgery that I can do immediately, I still saw myself basically. Um, dying too young and I was really freaking out so and my partner also um, my spouse when she was looking at this she was really freaking out um, oh that didn't come out very nicely so I have so what did I do I researched it so I started to look I googled and I said to myself you know what this stupid tool I hate this tool I bet some grad student you know put together this tool and I started, I used all of the background knowledge that I have about how these things um, come to be in the world. I looked, I read a new, um, an article on this, on an advocacy website about the new tool that came out. I figured out who sort of authored it. You know, there's the authors, the first author, the second author, and then there's probably like way down the line, the person who actually did the work for it. That would be the grad student who's not going to get a lot of credit for it. Um, and so then I went and I found the article um, that was written by those things, and I saw that actually, you know, even in the article, um, it's not, it's a little bit dubious whether or not the, you know, this decision tool is actually a good thing for people, because do you really want people sitting in their kitchens looking at these really cold, hard statistics about their life expectancy? <laughs> um, and I went further, and I found uh I actually continued my research, and I won't drag you through it all, but I actually went ahead and I found, yes, it, indeed, it was a grad student who did this tool. It was her thesis. It was only a master's degree, so her expertise was not that intense. <laughs> and I found a picture of her, and she looked very young. And I said to myself, okay, I don't have to worry about this tool. This tool is not that important. I need to just go back to what my doctor said. But what I'm trying to sort of share with that experience is, first of all, that Sometimes the emotional aspect of reading is so overpowering that it's hard to even approach the text. Sometimes it's hard to even pick it up. So I'm thinking about, you know, myself with these kinds of things, you know, with a topic that was really scary and hard. But I'm thinking about a student with a math book or a nursing book or a sociology book. You know, name your book that is um, terrifying. They, they all can be that way, and it's like you don't even want to touch it, let alone, you know, dive in there and start grappling with it and making sense out of it. Um, that emotional aspect is really strong. But then also, how much confidence does it take me, how much experience amassed over a lifetime, and just the kind of um, the the license I give myself because I'm an educator and because I'm a professor and that I question what I read and I say, you know what, I don't like that. I don't I'm I don't want to I don't want to just stick with that interpretation. I'm gonna keep going. Um they have done some studies that have shown that these days um students uh you know the generation we're on to generation Z, which is kind of scary because we don't have any letters left. I think we're gonna have to go back to A. But generation Y and Generation Z, um, they have shown that people these people who, when they go online and they surf and they look for the answer to a question, they just, they do it way faster than our generation does. They do it in like 20 seconds, whereas we might take like 70 seconds. But that's because they just pick the first thing. So it's really, really important that, um, you know, and that example that I gave does not get into what about the insurance paperwork that comes back, you know, um, what about, and all of these kinds of life, ex life decisions that come up for people, for any person living in this world, we have to be able to navigate text. And so what I'm showing you right now is a screenshot of a, a video called Reading Between the Lives, which you can Google. It's on, it's on Vimeo. It's free. Um, and you don't need to watch the whole thing because it's an hour long. But you could watch the first 15 minutes and get a really powerful glimpse of how our students feel about um, their reading and about and what that the impact on their sense of self. So they really feel um, disempowered when they don't feel like they're in control of 
uh, the text that they're grappling with. And I feel like what happens a lot of times, for some reason, um, because I don't know anybody working in a community college who's not passionately dedicated to helping our students, but some, for some people it translates into kind of rescuing students from difficulty. You know, so for example, at Pasadena City College, we have a first year experience course, and um, it is uh, UC and CSU transferable, but it's also open access. And so we have a really challenging course, and we need to differentiate our instruction so that all of the students can um, complete this challenging reading that we're giving them. And it's hard. It's a lot of reading. It's really, it's a lot of work, and we expect them to do the work. And we get feedback all the time from um, from the people in their lives that the students don't like it, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know they don't like it. Um, well, two points about that, you know, one is that, you know, I go to my yoga class and I don't like to stay in plank position for very long because it's incredibly painful, but I could go there and lay on the mat. I'm just giving up my time and my money and nothing's going to happen, but, you know, so there are sit-ups and push-ups that people need to do, that everybody needs to do to make progress. So that's the first point. You don't have to like every single thing that you do. But the second point, too, you know, which gets to the the insider and outsider idea is that, you know, it's a badge of honor to complain about your work in college. I know, you know, when I went, I was so excited to get overloaded with homework and to complain and say, oh, I have way too much. I don't know how I'm going to do all of this and carry my great big bag of books around. If somebody had come up to me and said, oh, okay, you know, it's too much for you, clearly. Let me take your bag. I, I got those books. I, they would have ruined my life, like literally, you know, being in college and being a student and and walking around with my heavy bag of books was my entire tether to um, to life and to some kind of a hopeful future. So I'm not sure what it is about our culture where when our students are struggling or complaining about workload, we seek to rescue them from that rather than support them so that they can do it and, ha and build up their competency. So I have this quote for you from Brene Brown um, from her book, Daring Greatly, and you can take a look at it for yourself. But she's basically saying that, you know, she thinks that disengagement is a huge, a huge problem for students and for people in community. And that, you know, and I, and the disengagement, which I would connect to the sort of monkey mind stuff, being distracted all the time and being, getting ourselves a little bit addicted to devices, you know, all of that kind of behavior, that distracted behavior is a really great thing that we turn to as a strategy to deal with feeling shame, feeling uh, underconfident, and feeling a little lost and without purpose. And so when she says that we disengage when we feel like the people who are leading us aren't living up to their end of the social contract, I connect that to um, educators giving students true opportunities to grapple with real problems and with real texts and real situations, and also that we show them how we do that. So we got to be in there grappling with them whether that means we are actually reading with them or whether that means we are carving out the time to give them opportunities for problem solving and sense making and we're right there with them as a coach or a mentor. But we have to make the time to do that because it does take it does take more time to help somebody do something themselves than to simply do it for them. That's another lesson I learned from parenting with my son and you know, the tying of the shoes takes a very long time if he does it himself. But if I, do, if I do it for him, I'm going to be doing it for him for the rest of our lives. So I better, I better let him do it. So I think that academic literacy is a lifeline. Um, and I feel like this is true for all students and all people. But I feel like it's particularly true for marginalized students, students who are generally disempowered, who already feel like outsiders. I feel like this is really important because when you can engage in text-based discussion in a classroom, you're an insider somewhere. You're an insider in that conversation. You've just joined a community of practice. It's incredibly powerful. That in and of itself, if that happens with one class, we know that that can be the hook that keeps people coming back, that gives them a sense of, yes, I can do this thing. 
Um, and that I think that those two really strong currents in our culture right now, that monkey mind, that distractedness, and a sense of shame around not, not knowing, not feeling confident grappling with tech, not feeling awash in a sea of information and not feeling like there is a strong foothold or a direction or a strong sense of being able to cope with it. I feel like our students really need us to directly intervene in that. And I feel like reading your apprenticeship can help. So hopefully I've made the case for why focusing on academic literacy makes a lot of sense. And I honestly and truly feel that this can happen and needs to happen, not just in the classroom, but throughout the student's experience in a college or a university, that we can show them what we do. We can show them what we insiders do, um, and we can invite them in. So let me describe what this framework is. Um, and it's represented by these four dimensions. And it, it gets a little bit eggheaded here, so I'll just try to keep it brief. Um, the main things to notice are in the background, extensive reading. So as I mentioned, you know, I think people need to be reading, students need to be reading more, not less. I think we do a big disservice when we cut back on the reading. I think it's fine to curate the reading or to, you know, it's important to do something with it. So, you know, equally unhelpful to students is a is when a professor says, read chapters 18 through 25, and then never talks about it in class, you know, that too is kind of a disaster because um, there's, you're just sort of like bobbing along in an ocean of text still. So it's just one more instance of that. Um, but in any case, reading more, not less, is, is one of the main aspects of this framework. And then focusing on these four overlapping dimensions the social dimension, so creating safety so that people feel comfortable um, showing their confusion and actually talking about what's going on in their mind, absolutely critical. And we know that um, nobody can learn if they are so freaked out that they're reverting back to their lizard brain and they're not accessing their, um, their, their frontal cortex. So the social dimension is huge. The personal dimension is huge. You know, understanding who you're dealing with, getting a sense of who they are, where they're coming from. Um, and that personal dimension, all of these are connected, but that connects really strongly to the knowledge building dimension. You know, because a lot of knowledge building, it's not just about the new content. New content is meaningless. Um, it's not going to do anything for anyone or stick with anyone unless it can attach to old. So um, we just had a conversation with my father-in-law about the notion of decaf coffee. This is something he can he does not seem to understand <laughs> because he says, oh, so-and-so wants only decaf coffee, but I gave him regular and he couldn't tell the difference. It's like, right, because it's not about taste. It's, it's about um, it not keeping you up at night. But if you don't, if you've never thought about caffeine, if it doesn't, it's just not in your on your radar, that's a piece of background knowledge that, you know, it's impossible to sort of work with. So all of the sort of schema that many of us have about nutrition these days. People from other generations don't necessarily share that same schema, so it's hard to have a conversation about things that seem basic um, when that background knowledge is not shared. So very often our students seem like they're sort of don't know these basic things that they're supposed to know. You know, how do you not know about Cuba? You know, how do you not know about uh, whatever, fill in the blank. A lot of times it isn't, it isn't that. It isn't this sort of big gaping not knowing. It's just more um, trying to get at it differently. Um, like, or it's about figuring out, okay, well, what do you know? And then how do we attach to that, to that topic? Um, so maybe don't start with who's familiar with you know, the Bay of Pigs, but rather start with, um, you know, well, who's watched CSI Miami, <laughs> you know, and, and back into different topics um, from ways that are not as threatening or that connect. But also, most of our students have tremendous depth of really sophisticated knowledge of all kinds of things, and they need to be aware that all of that is something to be built upon in terms of 
the academic learning that they need to do. That stuff should not be shoved in a box and set aside. We need to build on it. And that's not just for them. That's for all of us. Finally, the cognitive dimension that's represented here in this framework is sort of the, the sit-ups and push-ups that I was referring to earlier. You know, teaching students how to track their thinking, how to know when they are getting something or when they're not, um, and what to do about it then, and just doing the work, the work of understanding. And there are things that we do, that we experts do, um, that have become automatic. And so we need to remember what those are and uncover what those are. And a lot of times they're very specific to our expertise, whatever that expertise may be. Things become invisible to us um, because we figured it out so long ago or the problem-solving moves that we worked out happened um, so long ago that they're just automatic and we don't treat them. But if we can take the time to be metacognitive ourselves, figure out what those moves are that we make and what we do, then we can share those with students and we can apprentice them into the kinds of meaning making that we're doing. So that's why this is called reading apprenticeship because it's a partnership between an educator or an expert and the student or the novice. And it's building on the strengths that they're bringing, but it's also bridging the gap between what we know and what they haven't had an opportunity to work with yet. So we teach um, educators how to work with this framework through professional learning that um, is pretty much exactly what we would advocate doing in a classroom. And so, because we really need that, we really need to make space for our own learning and our own reflection. It's not easy to go back and uncover the way that, the way that we cope with things, the way that we used to do it as a novice or how we used to see it as a novice. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about um, our expertise and um, the moves that we make as experts and where students are coming from and thinking about how we can um, develop activities and experiences that will help students, um, that will give them opportunities to practice and in, in a low stakes kind of way, you know. So we work a lot in metacognitive routines. So um, we do routines that surface people's personal histories um, we, one of the things that we do that's extremely powerful in pretty much any setting is just opening up the conversation about um, how intimidating academic literacy, academic reading, and, and text can be. So, for example, while you may see people at any table in any restaurant joking about how they're not confident to calculate the tip and they're using their iPhone to do it and making all kinds of jokes about their math anxiety, which drives math instructors crazy um, because they hate that. You don't see people um, making those same kind of jokes around literacy-related topics. So I know for myself, if I'm at a fancy restaurant and there's something on the menu that I've never heard of, I don't ask the server. I Google it on my iPhone under the table because I feel like I should know. You know, I, I don't want to make it clear that I don't know what that thing is and whether it's fish, fowl, or fruit. So, so just talking about our personal history um, with reading and just letting people in the room know that they're not the only one who is overwhelmed or confused, that can be hugely powerful. But beyond that, we spend time um, working with text, capturing, you know, ask, asking the students to capture what their reading processes are and share those with each other and, you know, kind of see, okay, what are we doing? How's it working? How's it not working? Is somebody else doing something else that you could try? And just working on self-consciously, explicitly expanding a repertoire of problem-solving moves that we can make with text. And we also do that through um, making our thinking visible through think alouds, just having people, you know, work on a problem or work with a text with a partner and um, take turns surfacing their thinking. And then sometimes we do that, um, that routine um, in writing silently. So rather than the think aloud, which is really kind of a fun and social way of working with text in pairs, they can do um, talking to the text, basically a think aloud on paper where they capture their ideas um, in writing. And then they can bring those in and use them to launch uh, a conversation with a peer or in the whole group. Or, um, or teachers can collect those and see how the students are doing. 
same thing with um, metacognitive log. So a lot of times students don't want to write on a textbook, but you can ask them to just take notes, you know, on one two-sided piece of paper or on one side what struck them as important and on the other side why did it struck them as important. Basically just that they're, that they're capturing um, what's going on in their mind as they work with text. And so what you notice in a classroom, a reading apprenticeship classroom, is the expert or instructor modeling a lot of times to make their thinking visible. So you were, we're sort of showing, well, this is what I do with text. Um, and then the students engaging in guided practice of what's been modeled. And the students, you always see, if it's reading apprenticeship, you see students talking with each other about the reading. It's a student forward class, not an instructor forward class. And the focus is on comprehension, metacognitive conversation, collaboration, and again, the big one of providing support but emphasizing independence. So we're really, without throwing students in the deep end with no life jacket, we don't want to do that. That happens to them all the time anyway. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. But it's kind of providing as much support as needed at first, but having a plan for scaling back that support so that students get to take their reins um, and that they are, they are in charge of their learning and their reading, ultimately. Okay, so here's the part where we talk about how this can work in non-classroom settings. Um, and of course, I'm not an expert in these settings, and so I just have suggestions and ideas that we can use as a jumping off point, and some examples of how I know people have used these um, in non-classroom settings just from the the network of educators that I have the privilege of working with in California and beyond. Um, so tutoring is one of the first things that people think of with this framework. And I know at my school, we just didn't have very strong um, tutor development uh, programs. And a lot of times, even if it is awesome, you know, it's just like all learning and all, you know, professional development. It could stand to be um, to go on longer. It could stand to be more robust and more uh, longitudinal over time. So rather than a sort of an intensive tutor training experience that is in like a couple days and it's over. So a lot of faculty um, who have encountered reading apprenticeship have immediately brought it to their tutors, feeling like, well, I might not have my colleague from chemistry jump into this right away. I might have a ways to go before I convince them to do that, but I can at least get the tutors in the STEM center working with it. Um, so I give you here just a short list, and there are more colleges in um, California with um, pretty robust work with reading apprenticeship and tutoring settings. And so if anybody's interested, I can um, put you in touch with um, faculty or staff um, who work with tutors and, and reading apprenticeship to follow up. But um, my colleague, Danny Pitaway, who is very enthusiastic um, about both tutoring and reading apprenticeship, um, he shared with me that one of the things that, you know, he doesn't feel like the students necessarily really engage, you know, with or love that graphic for the framework. You know, they don't know that they know enough about being an educator in general like we do to, to really hook into all of that. But he, they, they just really respond to the opportunity to do these routines, thinking aloud and talking to the text, with their um, tutees because it's something that they can do. And I think a lot of times tutors are the quote-unquote smart kids who get it, and they're not, they don't know any better than we know. I mean, it's really hard for all of us to figure out, well, what is it that you don't get, and how do I help you get it? You know, so that's challenging for even a veteran um, instructor. So this is something practical that they can do that gives them a window in and helps them focus and, um, and not just take over. Again, you know, a lot of tutors end up doing stuff for the 2T, even though that's obviously not what they're trained to do, but it's just kind of a natural response that we often have is to rescue people from their confusion. The other thing that is really great about reading apprenticeship in tutoring settings is that um, a lot of times the tutors, though they are strong students, that doesn't mean that they don't also struggle with text. It doesn't mean that they don't also, you know, want help with their own problem solving and grappling. And so 
time after time, um, people will tell me that the tutors that they've trained with reading apprenticeship have said, why didn't somebody tell me about this earlier? And they just immediately start using these techniques for their own learning as well. So it's nice working on two levels when you're training student tutors to use reading apprenticeship. Um, okay. Um, in financial aid settings, you know, I remember filling out the FAFSA for myself, and I remember what a high stakes um, experience it was, and I remember what an idiot I thought I was, I felt like, and I mean, all forms and important documents like that when I was a young person, I felt like an absolute moron, um, either because somebody was telling me that I was based on the mistake that I made or just because I didn't know. And so I, I was thinking, you know, it's possible that um, you could work with students one-on-one -on -one while they're filling out the FAFSA, but I don't think that you have that many opportunities to do that. But I was wondering what would it be like to have some, you know, kind of decontextualized from their own actual practical needs to fill it out, um, some workshops that were short and fun for small groups of students, and you could pull out some of the more obtuse areas of the FAFSA or other related documents that are really hard, and just use reading apprenticeship to set up an activity where the students are problem solving with that and sharing their problem solving with each other. And again, just sort of making it equal and making it um, low stakes and actually fun, a fun social experience to problem solve with this text and that also gain confidence in their ability to do that. Um, advising, same thing, really hard. I put a picture here on uh, the slide of, I recently had to figure out for a context piece I was writing for classroom video case, what is the difference between general physics 1B, C, D, or general physics 2A, B, C, or general physics 31A? <laughs> it's really hard, you know, it's really hard if you're not an expert to figure out what the differences are. Um, and so again, I know that a lot of advising has to do with curating these different documents, college catalog and the ASSIST and the IGETC and the GE requirements and all those all of these incredibly, um, I think, difficult documents. To an expert, maybe they don't seem intimidating, but I know that a lot of it is that you guide students through, but there's also space to do problem solving. You know, let them problem solve with some of these texts and surface what they're thinking with them and surface their confusion. And when they do that, then you're going to learn a lot more about what it is that they don't get and avoid that um, situation of students coming back with the same question or the same concern or the same issue and you're thinking, I just, I, we just did this. You know, like I don't understand how, how I have to go back to the beginning and explain this to you again because I just spent 45 minutes explaining it to you last time. So, um, so my last couple of slides, so those are just a few examples that I think of some spaces where I could see the framework being a really helpful guide for how to set up really productive problem solving learning experiences for students. Um, and I just, I want to say something about um, communities of practice because this is a theory that I really think about all the time and it's relevant on two levels. One is that um, in California through 3CSN we work a lot in communities of practice for professional learning so that we have a safe space to learn ourselves. So any of the ideas that I just suggested could, you know, it could be something that you try out and you're thrilled and it goes wonderfully, or it could be an absolute disaster and you are, you know, sticking pins in a Nika-shaped um, doll because it's so painful. You know, it's hard to change, in other words. It's not necessarily going to go great the first time. And we need to practice, and our students need practice in doing things differently. So a community of practice, we can intentionally create that for new experiences um, in order to support our own learning. But also I think we need to recognize that we work in communities of practice and we are all part of this one giant, huge higher education insider is a community of practice and students are outside of that. And in order for them to get in, they have to have opportunities to participate meaningfully in it. We can't just tell them, you're in. Okay, we let you in. 
no, we have to let them actually be contributing members and doing some of their own problem solving is one of the ways that they can do that. Um, and so my last, um, I'm really glad I'm going to get to stop talking because <laughs> I feel like I don't know, it's, it's hard to talk and not get feedback. Um, so this is my last slide and I just, I think that what you already know and what I hope resonates about this approach and, th and thinking about academic literacy in this way is that pretty much nothing about our students' education is about the content, quote unquote. It's really about the contact with the people. Um, we know that that's the difference between them sticking around in college and not. And I think that academic literacy is a, is a it's hugely impactful in student sense of self and of competence. And that, you know, as Donna Lynn Miller says in her book, The Book Whisperer, which I've quoted here, you know, the difference between a quote unquote non-reader, as many students will identify themselves, or she says dormant reader, um, and an engaged reader or a confident reader is really, a lot of times it's, it comes down to modeling and to having the opportunity to participate with uh, more experienced others and to bring them into the, the community practice that we're in as, as educators and as people who grapple with text and problem solve with text and take control. So it's all about the interaction and it's all about the attachment between and among people. It's all about relationships. That's what makes learning work. Okay, so here on the slide there are some resources if you wanted to learn more. Um, and it's time for the Q&A part. Great, Nika, thank you so much. That was um, incredible. And it looks like one of the um, questions was answered here was uh, just simply, how could someone get more training? It looks like that's on the slide here. So um, if yep. you guys are interested, you know, in um, maybe uh, getting together a couple of folks from your campus or from your programs to learn about this strategy and start to incorporate it into the support that they're giving to your foster youth students. Um, it looks like they would just go to readingapprenticeship.org. Is that right, Mika? Yep. Although it's also, okay. it's kind of like all of the things online, it's an overwhelming web page. So if you get lost, you can also just email me and I can help you find the right um, spots, you know, where are, but there's a professional development um, tab and then there's a community college tab and that's where you want to be. Um, that's, and our college level work is sort of, we started out community college, but it's sort of quickly becoming just college because we have interest from everybody and there's really not much difference. Great. Thank you. Um, and then another question is, is there a video available that looks at or kind of shows you the strategy of talking to the text to kind of see it in action? Yes, that is something I'm trying to think. We have. Um, several classroom videos, like short versions, up also on readingapprenticeship.org. Um, and so you can see a reading apprenticeship classroom, and I'm trying to think if any of them specifically features talking to the text. If not, um, most, many of them feature think aloud and metacognitive logs. Um, but uh, I, have, I have a video of an instructor that an instructor made for his students, a math instructor, so I can send that. If you send me an email, I can send you the video. Okay, great. If you can um, get, we'll, we'll work that out and I can send it to uh, the person asking the question. Um, and then I guess the other, the other question that I got was, um, you know, if someone became, in, if they did this six week online course and kind of learned the strategies available, is this something that they could bring back um, to their campuses and kind of train the trainer and kind of build an army of folks on their campuses who would use this in the classroom and in their financial aid sessions, advising sessions, et cetera. Is that possible? It is absolutely possible. Um, the six week online course is set up as an introduction and it gives you, um, every week there's a making it real assignment and it asks you to try out um, these routines with students 
And so um, in the classroom or in some other way or, you know, we sometimes we get creative about how to do that. If, like, say, an administrator really wants to take the course alongside faculty, maybe um, she borrows a classroom or maybe she observes the classroom. But um, we give people a chance to really explore these metacognitive routines first before being um, taking on the position or being put in the position of leader. But then, and also just to decide, you know, do you really want to continue to invest in this? Because it's not, you know, it's not a silver bullet. It's not for everybody. Um, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. And I think it's worthy of lots of years of my life to focus on this framework. Um, but that's not for everybody. And that's one of the beautiful things about um, about this community of practice rather than sort of like a program that claims to be, you know, the solution. But anyway, so that's, so we really like to build in time for people to work with the framework um, as a practitioner first. But then there is the leadership community of practice, which is specifically designed for you to become a trainer um, on your own campus. And that definitely I recommend for anybody who decides that they are passionate about this and they, they have a mission. Um, it's expensive to do the train the trainer, but it's actually in the long run, since you get to then do as many workshops on your campus as you want, grow as many people as you want, it's just a great investment. Um, so, and I can always give also more information about that to anybody if you want to contact me. Perfect. Great. Well, those are all the questions we've got. I think this is a great um, introduction to um, a new strategy that all of you can use. And if you guys have any additional questions that you didn't think of as you're looking at the um, PowerPoint again, or if you're doing some research on your own about RA, um, if you don't know if it's happening on your campus and you're interested in learning if it is on your campus and if those campuses listed on this presentation wasn't your campus, we can also help you find out um, that information as well and help you find the people who are using RA um, on, on your campus. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that there will be um, a call out for presenters um, on June 3rd for um, the practice call. The next practice call will be June 3rd. And then also we are um, excited to have Blueprint, our conference, coming up on October 26th and 27th in L.A. So many of you probably got to save the date for the Blueprint Conference. So that is happening October 26th and 27th. And our next practice call will be on June 3rd. Um, thank you all for um, being with us this morning. And big thanks to Nika for your time um, as you're on vacation. We really appreciate that. <laughs> and um, we hope you all have a wonderful day and a great um, spring break coming up. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.